Thank you very much first for the invitation, uh, Simon and Oscar, and for the chance to, um, to talk with the book. So, and, and to revisit the book in some ways, because it, it was two years ago that it came out kind of right in the run up to lockdown. So it's a bit of a, a COVID book in many respects. And so, um, uh, you know, it, I did a few Zoom events then, and then I haven't really revisited it for a little while. And it was very nice to have this opportunity to sort of think about the argument again and, and think about the content. And so um, I'm, I'm treating this as kind of the, uh, a paperback book uh, launch event. So the book is in paperback now, um, which is very nice because it's actually affordable. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, I'm just delighted to have the chance to, to speak about, about the project. And so essentially the theme that I want to talk focus on, which is the theme of the book, is how we as theorists have historically and could today conceptualize the relationship between democracy and the welfare state. And this is really the dominant kind of problem area that the book is intervening in. Um, and so in my presentation today, I'm going to talk, try to sort of integrate both, and you know, let me put a timer on as well, integrate both the, um, do justice to both the theoretical side and the empirical side. So I don't know to what extent in the audience there are kind of like very hardcore theorists, very hardcore empirical people. And so I'm gonna sort of try to go um, fairly in depth on both sides. So I presented the book before to like more purely empirical audiences where I really don't go into the more intricate theoretical architecture of the book. And I've done more. So I'm gonna really try to do both sides of the book project. Cause as Simon was saying, one of the real aspirations of the book is to really de develop a kind of um, rigorously theoretically grounded argument in the tradition of critical social theory, but to do so in a way that really is quite sensitive to and engaged with both the empirical scholarship on the welfare state, um, the debate between, um, for example, people like Gosta Esping Anderson versus um, uh, 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 Iverson and Scotchpool and um, these different frameworks, or Soskis, sorry, not Scotchpool, Soskis, um, these different sort of empirical frameworks for understanding the welfare state, which I'll talk about during the talk. So is the welfare state primarily a result of uh, worker power? Is it more tied to business interests? Um, and really incorporate that into a normative theory of the welfare state, and then to also incorporate a rigorous appraisal of the history of the welfare state, which is where I want to begin. So um, uh, sort of in some ways the scene or the puzzle that the entire book departs from is the origin, original advent of the welfare state in late 19th century Germany. Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of the debate about Bismarck's social insurance laws, which were passed in the 1880s, and which inaugurated the first national social welfare institutions. But of course, they did this in the context of a quasi-authoritarian regime. And the explicit goal of these laws was to um, uh, restrict or even uh, suppress what was then the most powerful in and inclusive workers' movement in Europe that was organized around the SPD, the Socialist Party of Germany. Um, and this left the socialists in a real dilemma as kind of the representatives of, you could say, democratic aspirations in 19th century Germany. And with the goal of transforming both the political and the economic system, how was it that they were to respond to Bismarck in some ways um, uh, trying to take the territory of social reform and show that the state could be responsive to the needs of workers? And Bismarck himself was really convinced that if the state did more to meet the material needs of workers, that um, workers were sort of naturally monarchist in their inclinations, and this would peel the loyalty of workers away from the Socialist Party. Um, uh, and so this cartoon is from the largest so circulation socialist magazine um, in Germany at the time, Der Val Jakob. Um, uh, this, it had up to two or 300,000 issues that were circulated for each edition. So it was kind of the populist um, magazine of the Socialist Party. And this was the cart one of the cartoons that they published in response to Bismarck's um, uh, social, you can see social reform, which is grounding state socialism. You can see each of the columns is one of the social reform laws. And this is all they say, the patrimony of the disinherited. So this is sort of the only thing that the workers who are the disinherited are getting is this rickety structure while the opposition parties look on at what was happening. And so in the book, I, I look at this historical moment and the response that the socialists took towards this um, institution. I look at a very ironic uh, 
um, and counterintuitive and I think quite surprising aspect of what happened. So they passed this social these social insurance laws with the explicit goal of suppressing the workers' movement. Bismarck openly hopes that this will gain the loyalty of workers to the monarchical authoritarian aspect of the German um, state. Um, and But what we see within five years of this is tens, if not hundreds of thousands of workers who start to participate in the actual um, democratic operation of this new social welfare state. And in part, this was because of a quirk of German, um, the way German institutionalized welfare, because there are pre-existing social networks of mutual support that unions and other organizations had created. And these institutions kind of were built on top of that. But the result is that there are so many workers participating in the running, in particular, of the healthcare system, that the conservative party started talking about the Herrschaft der SPD, so the domination of the socialists in the social welfare state, and actually demanded that Bismarck start to crack down on um, uh, these social health care funds. And Bismarck apparently responded to this by saying that the insurance system must be lubricated with a drop of democratic oil if it is to run properly. And so the argument of the book as a whole in some ways is encapsulated in this case, which is that social welfare institutions are the product of state building um, efforts of economic, um, they are, exist within the context of capitalism, um, that they are not in many ways, just the simple unfolding of claims to social inclusion and universal moral rights. Nonetheless, because these social welfare institutions have to create public institutions and public objects of collective governance and collective mobilization, they provide opportunities for democratic social movements to both participate in the state and also challenge larger structures of domination in society. And so the goal of the book is to take these sorts of historical episodes where we see evidence of this and situate that within a larger theoretical framework. And so to do that, the book really challenges three dominant approaches to thinking about the welfare state that are, that are I'd say, the kind of prominent theoretical frameworks that also have a lot of influence on the empirical research on the welfare state. So let's trans. So that's my historical, my um, kind of the sort of historical cases I'm interested in. But I want to transition now into some of the more um, theoretical argument of the book. So I'm going to go pretty pretty hard theory now for a while, but then we'll come back to some empirical case studies at the end. So hopefully, um, between the theory and the case studies, you'll get a sense of um, the the two sides of the book. So there, are, in my view, sort of three dominant models of the welfare state. Um, that the book is trying to challenge and supplant. So what is a market failure model of the welfare state? So according to this idea, markets um, on their own or capitalism on its own does not provide this sort of um, uh, educational training um, or un employment insurance that's actually necessary for capitalism to work well. So there are market failures, there are collective, there are public goods or externalities within capitalism and the welfare state sort of fills in these gaps. And so this view is, is very closely associated in my mind with um, what's very often called the varieties of capitalism approach to the welfare state. So this is the idea that, um, for example, unemployment insurance can enable workers to get certain sort of employment training because they know that if they lose their job, they're gonna receive retraining. And so it actually helps markets function better. And so you get theories of what are often called coordinated market economies, where social welfare institutions are kind of functionally interdependent with different aspects of capitalism, and they account for these sorts of market failures within capitalism. So that's one model that I'm going to reject because I think this, and I, in the book I say more about why, but I basically think this underplays the conflictual contestatory aspect of the, of the origins of the welfare state and their continued, um, its continued operation. So the second framework that does get more at this conflictual notion is the social citizenship idea. So this is the idea that there's been a gradual expansion of rights from civil and political rights to include clear well-being. And this view is in particular associated with the um, essay on citizenship and social class by T.H. Marshall, um, which um, uh, is sort of still one of the foundational texts for thinking about the nature of social citizenship. Although strangely it's out of print, but that's another, uh, another story, I suppose. And so according to this theory, the welfare state is kind of part of a logic of rights themselves. So it's kind of an implicit logic within rights claims where, for example, um, political rights to be truly meaningful require a certain amount of material support. 
This is what someone like John Rawls also called the fair value of rights. And so this kind of creates a, a pressure to expand rights into these new domains, such as housing, education, and the economy. Um, and again, in the book, I, I say more about why I think this framework is inadequate, but simply put it, I think it provides an overly, I would say, um, uh, optimistic gloss on the welfare state. It, I, if, if the market failure model sort of ties the welfare state too closely to capitalism, this view tends to apply, imply, I think, too much autonomy from structure of capitalist society and, 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 and in particular structures of domination, which I'll again talk about more. And then the last framework which the book tries to challenge is one um, according to which welfare institutions are essentially mechanisms of political co-optation and integration. And so this view obviously goes back to the socialist movement and critiques of reformism, but finds expression in contemporary theories inspired by Michel Foucault um, uh, that essentially look at the disciplinary function of social welfare institutions. And in contrast to all three of these views then, what the book tries to advance is a view of welfare institutions as mechanisms for democratic empowerment and participation in the context of structures of domination. And so um, I think this, in this, our idea captures in some ways the best of the other frameworks, um, but it allows for a much more, you could say, um, tentative view of the potential benefits of the welfare state. So welfare institutions, on my view, are not inherently democratic, they're not inherently in inclusive, but they provide opportunities for, for inclusive and more universalist um, democratic social movements to then challenge structures of domination, such as class domination, gender domination, or racial domination, through um, participation in the operation of these welfare institutions. By making certain um, implicit structures of domination explicit, they can then expose them to critical challenge and transformation. And so on the theoretical side of the book, essentially what I'm trying to do is then develop these two sides of this claim. So I try to develop the democratic empowerment side and participation side. I sort of provide a theory of what that means. I try to develop what I mean by domination. And then I turn to some practical um, historical episodes to show how this, the theory that I developed in the earlier parts of the book can give us some critical traction for actually under, for seeing how in the history of the welfare state, there have been these moments where um, democratic social movements have successfully challenged structures of domination. But I also argue that's always a, an only partial process. And so unlike the kind of social rights theory where there's a kind of background story of progress that informs the theory of the welfare state, my argument is that the welfare state only ever partially, social movements can only ever partially address these structures of domination or partially overcome these structures of domination through the welfare state. So it's a kind of always um, tentative process. Okay, so to recap very briefly, so um, I'm inspired by historical episodes where you see kind of counterintuitive opportunities for participation in the welfare state arising through a need to respond to political pressure or political demands. I'm trying to challenge three dominant models of the welfare state, so a market failure model, a social rights model, and a, a political co-optation model. My theory is about democratic participation and challenges to domination. And now let's get into the actual th the theoretical meat of how I developed that idea. And this is where things can get a little intricate. You know, and I look back at the book and I think Simon, you were very kind to say, you know, I, I did a good job integrating them. I always feel like I can do more. And it's a quite um, complex internal uh, structure because in some ways there are sort of two big ideas that I had while I was working on the book that I wanted to develop. So one, and this is on the kind of, the, the more purely theoretical side. So this is the part of the book where the audience is really, you know, political theorists um, uh, in, in particular in, special, in, in specialization. And then I try to do parts that, are, that speak to more broad debates. So the two big, I, the two core ideas that I really want to develop in the theoretical side of the book. First is that a lot of our bad views of the welfare state can be traced back to the influence of Max Weber's political thought on the kind of conceptual categories that we bring to bear on the welfare state. Um, and the way in which Weber was actually reacting to historical moments like Bismarck's creation of the welfare state. So that's the, and, and, and that we can use, we can construct a dialogue between Hannah Arendt and Max Weber to see an alternative kind of theoretical um, framework that could um, allow us to see more opportunities for democratic participation, even within bureaucratic or administrative structures that are often portrayed as, as very top-down um, and undemocratic in nature. And so I sort of reconstructed 
debate between Weber and Arendt to, to think about the sort of assumptions that, that we as theorists and scholars bring to bear on the welfare state that might obscure these possibilities for democratic participation. Um, and that, and then the, so that's the first kind of theoretical idea. And that's really about the means of the welfare state, right? That's really about how should we think about the kind of institutions themselves. The second is I wanted to develop an account of domination that I thought um, would be more sophisticated and more useful than a lot of the accounts that are existing in the theoretical literature. And this is really grounded in, in my interpretation of Jürgen Habermas's theory of domination. And this is really then about the goal of um, the welfare state. What's the objective that we're pursuing? How should we think about structures of domination and what it means to challenge them? And I guess I'll say this is kind of the high theory part of the book. So this is where I really go into um, uh, my, you know, I put on my pure political theorist lens and I do my close readings and then my reconstructions of these authors. And so again, I'll give you a sense of what is, what I try to argue in these areas. Um, but if people have questions about this, I'm happy to go into it further as well during the Q&A because this is gonna be a sort of a, a quite condensed version of both of these arguments. Um, oh, sorry, I, I forgot about this. this it's been a while since I've done this presentation. And then I have two cases, I'll turn to this after, but this is a little preview. So I have these two cases then, or these two historical episodes that I'm gonna look at, um, that I look at in the book, which I've already talked a little bit about one, but I'll use these to flesh out the theory. So the first is, as I already mentioned, the participation of German workers in the administration of Bismarck's social insurance laws. And then I also look at the mobilization of Swedish feminism in the post-war period and how they worked within the Swedish activists worked within the Swedish welfare state to challenge uh, structures of gender domination. But let's get, let me get into the theory um, a little bit so we have a sense of, of what I'm trying to do in these more theoretical parts of the, the book. So let me start first with this kind of first body of theoretical argument, which is really about the relationship between kind of technical calculation and political action and how, that, how we theorize that relationship, the way we theorize that relationship, how it informs our account of the welfare state. And here I'm really re responding to a, a variety of views in political theory that insist on what's broadly called the autonomy of the political. And so this is kind of a, a long debate that's trying to articulate a kind of distinctive domain of political action over and against the, what was seen as the reductive econ economic approach that was kind of dominant within second international Marxism. And so here Weber and Arendt are seen as kind of key theorists. They're trying to carve out a space of autonomous political action or autonomous political agency. And, and quite notoriously, for example, in the case of Arendt, insisting on a very hard divide between the economic and the political or the social and the political. These are really meant to be kept apart. And very often what you see is theorists who are then drawing on these authors present the welfare state as a kind of domain of, of, of the colonization of politics by economic forces or economic rationalities or mindsets, right? And so you see um, in theorists this idea that the welfare state is really about sort of substituting authentic political action for top-down bureaucratic management of people's economic needs. And what I want to claim is that this is very much true of, Hannah, of Max Weber, but it's not true of Hannah Arendt's theory. And then in fact, Hannah Arendt can give us a vantage point from which to critique Max Weber. And so in many ways, the, the, I turn to Weber because I think his image of the welfare state is in the background for many of the theories I'm trying to critique. And I try to trace out some of the ways we might see this in the book. And in particular, I think the Weberian image of the welfare state is one of a bureaucratic structure that reduces material needs to technical calculation. And so this, you can see, for example, in clearly in the kind of co-optation view of the welfare state, but I think also in the so social rights view in very subtle ways um, that they have this notion that sort of we have these social rights and then the job of the welfare state is to kind of be the instrument that realizes these social rights. Um, uh, and what I argue in the book is that this sort of image of the welfare state is deeply rooted in Weber's sociology and in particular the, the distinction he draws between calculable everyday needs and extraordinary experiences that give rise to values. <laughs> and so according to this theory, the welfare state is kind of the domain of calculable everyday needs. And we need to sort of um, challenge it through charismatic democratic social movements that can advance more substantive sorts of values against it. Um, and I want to actually, see, so Arendt is often seen as, as repeating this argument in Weber, as being very much an orthodox Weberian thinker as really echoing Weber's distinction between the everyday and the extraordinary in her thought. 
And so according to this theory, Arendt sort of valorizes these episodic moments of collective democratic action in things like council democracy or participatory democracy. And she really worries about the colonization of those spaces of democratic freedom by economic mentalities or what she often calls the social. So this is a very, I would say kind of if you study Arendt, one of the number one critiques of Arendt is this kind of critique of the social that she really believed in this dom distinct domain of freedom. And I'm part of a sort of revisionary reading of Arendt that several people like Patrick Markell and others have developed that actually shows she has a very sophisticated analysis of the role that economic forces or needs should play in politics. And in fact, her argument was never to exclude those from politics, but to make sure they enter in the right way. And in particular, to make sure they don't enter as kind of mechanisms of objects of economic calculation or means and rationality, but that they enter as sites of co collective judgment and collective um, uh, political participation. And so this comes through, for example, in her analysis of property. So she's very worried that the modern understanding of property as merely a means to an end loses a kind of dimension of, of property that she thinks is really important, which is that it provides people a kind of stable place in the world from which to enter into politics. And so all of this is grounded in, in a larger category in her thought, which she calls worldliness. And this is the idea that every material object can actually be, uh, is structures our relationships to each other and is more than just a means to an and but actually is a potential site of democratic judgment and participation. And so she insists in the human condition um, that everything that is must appear and nothing can appear without a shape of its own. Hence, there is in fact no thing that does not in some way transcend its, its functional use its, and its transcendence, its ugly beauty or ugliness is identical with appearing publicly and being seen. And so she provides a kind of extended analysis of this aspect of the world that Nothing is a mere tool. Nothing is a mere means to an end. Even kind of things that appear to be mechanisms for meeting instrumental goals have to appear and so be judged as political, potentially political objects. And so essentially the thought I have is that I, to apply this sort of analysis of worldliness to the welfare state. So go back to Bismarck's social insurance laws, right? What is happening there? Well, part of what's happening is the state is trying to transform the material needs of workers into, into something that can be rendered calculable by the state, can be governed by the state. But part of what workers, but part of what had to happen is for that to occur, they had to operate through institutional structures that were not just kind of automatic technical needs for an end. They required the agency and participation of workers themselves and so create spaces for workers to try to insist that they were the best judges of their material needs. And so they needed to democratically participate in these processes of determining the nature of those needs and how the state could meet them. And so this challenges, I think, the kind of the bearing model of the welfare state that's just about reducing technical, reducing kind of lived experience or people's material needs into objects of state calculation and state regulation. Okay, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to go um, as in depth into the theory of domination I develop in the book. This could also become a long, a long um, uh, uh, theoretical discussion. Um, uh, so I just want to say a few things about this quickly. And again, I can revisit this if people um, have questions during the Q&A. Um, uh, but suffice to say, part of what I try to do, so I, the Weber rent de debate is kind of about how we think about the institutional structure of the welfare state itself. I then try to develop a theory of domination that I think can do justice to what I see as the different levels of domination as they operate within the welfare state. Um, and in particular, what I try to do in this theory is account for um, three distinct levels at which we can analyze domination. So one is in direct relationships between individuals where one person might dominate another um, by controlling their environment. The other is in kind of the relationship between social groups and how um, different social groups might have excessive power to determine the norms of social interaction. So here the classic example is gender domination, where men kind of have, um, you could say, a, a background power to structure the norms of interaction within society, the norms of uh, family life, the norms of the workplace, and so on, without any one individual necessarily dominating any single other individual. It happens kind of in the background structural level. And then the third is the sort of domination that people like Foucault and others are looking at, which is the domination that occurs through becoming a kind of rational agent 
or subject. And so there's a lot of worry that the welfare state dominates people by creating kind of norms of bourgeois responsibility, respectability, and so on. And so what I wanna say is we need to take seriously all these different facets of domination, and, but we can see how in the welfare state, social movements have been able historically to challenge domination on each of these levels. Um, and again, it's always a partial process, but this is what I really think is the goal of, um, should, how we should articulate the goals of these welfare, of these social movements as they operate in the welfare state. So the goal is not just redistribution. It was not kind of meeting a, uh, trying to meet a minimum level of material well-being. It was to constantly be making explicit these structures of domination and then trying to use welfare institutions to transform how they operated in society. And this is then what I try to trace out in the more empirical side of the book, or this is what I try to integrate through the empirical aspects of the project. So after I developed the theoretical structure, I then try to look at sort of historical episodes that, um, uh, again, the point of these is not to prove that my theory is true. Um, and there um, uh, are obviously still counterexamples, but they're to try to show that the sort of theoretical categories I'm analyzing through political theory are also being articulated by actors participating in social movements. And so I actually try to approach social movements as kind of sources of political theory, right? I sort of say, what was the sort of self-understanding that we can see in actors to the extent that we have evidence, drawing on historical, but also ethnographic or anthropological work on these kinds of social movements? How can we see them as themselves developing a theory of what the welfare state is about and how they might transform them? And so this isn't meant to be necessarily proof for my theory. It's more meant to be an additional resource for thinking about sort of concepts and categories that I'm interested in. That said, I, both the cases I took are kind of hard cases. So I still did try to take cases where um, it might be counterintuitive or harder to find the sort of dynamics that I'm pointing to. Um, uh, and so, for example, in Bismarck's Germany, you know, this is typically taken as the paradigmatic example of how the welfare state is a kind of anti-democratic project. But <clears throat> similarly, in, in Sweden, you know, people often talk about Sweden as state feminism and really downplay the kind of bottom-up participatory aspect or the social movement aspect of, of the dynamics of feminism in the post-war period. So again, I'm trying to use cases where it might be more counterintuitive to even to show even in these sorts of cases, we can reinterpret them to see these sorts of these sorts of possibilities, thus an easier cases, we might also be able to detect these sorts of things. <coughs> so what I want to argue in both these cases is that welfare institutions are really crucial infrastructures for democratic mobilization. So far from making, turning kind of, um, dissipating the, the democratic energy of social movements, which is often the model that this is kind of about the waning or integration of social movements into the state, I think there's a lot of cases and a lot of evidence that welfare institutions can become this kind of infrastructure for democratic mobilization. They can provide institutional resources and offices for these social movements. And obviously then it's a question of how do you balance kind of the autonomy of the social movements with the use of these sorts of resources. But they can also turn what are often very individual and silent sorts of material needs into objects of public judgment and democratic contestation. So they can transform a kind of domain that is um, often outside of politics into the potential objects of democratic life. Um, and so again, I look at this through kind of two separate cases. So one is, as I already mentioned, the participation of German workers in the administration of Bismarck's social insurance laws. And the second is the mobilization of feminists challenging gender domination in post-war Sweden. And so I've already talked a little bit about the, the German case, um, uh, but what is really interesting in this case is both the extent of democratic participation. So the social insurance system was one of the most extensive systems of democratic participation we see in um, pre-democratic uh, Germany. So Germany before, uh, you know, the democratic revolution after World War I. And they were really a domain where workers were really, I think, quite strongly pushing to expand democratic participation. And so this is a quote from the, uh, one of the Berlin, uh, a Berlin leader, a leader who was based in Berlin in the German SPD, where he argued, and this was at a socialist conference, that welfare institutions can call on and organize workers themselves as the most knowledgeable interpreters of their, interpreters of their own wishes and demands. <clears throat> 
And so this is really what we see. We see as workers entered, again, we have based on, on the historical evidence, we have some record of the meetings that would occur at these social welfare institutions. And there's been um, uh, fairly extensive historical work on Ger in German, looking at the um, these social welfare institutions. But what we really see is, you know, part of why it was so important that these were democratic is there was actually a lot of political negotiation that was occurring at these institutions about the nature of things like workplace injuries. Are those political phenomena that require a kind of democratic intervention or are those random accidents? And so we see a kind of constant effort to reinterpret, you could say, social insurance issues as matters of collective politics, where workers themselves have a kind of political claim that needs to be made about how their needs should be met and who's responsible for, for meeting those needs. Um, and so then the second case I look at is um, when I kind of, I try to argue as a kind of dialectic of emancipation and domination in the post-war Swedish welfare state. Um, and so um, uh, I look in particular at the, um, the rise of these groups called, such as group eight, which were really challenging what they saw as the gender neutral um, uh, aspects of the post-war welfare state. And I trace out kind of what I see as a more critical anti-domination strain of analyzing the relationship between the gender, between gender and the welfare state, and a more integrative liberal strain of thinking about this, which is really um, represented by the Myrtles. Um, so Gunnar Myrtle, who um, was the first uh, co-winner of the Nobel Prize, and, and his wife, uh, 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 Violet Myrtle, um, wrote this important book called The Population Crisis, which came out in the 1930s. And that really sparked an enormous amount of um, work on how can the welfare state respond to questions of the family and gender. But the dominant framework for that book was we need to deal with declining birth rates, in part because we face these external military threats. And so we have to ensure that the welfare state kind of supports an adequate level of um, both material reproduction for the economy, but also um, uh, uh, sufficient amount of population to, to be militarily strong. And so I kind of contrast that with a more critical feminist discourse that was really focusing much more strongly on the unequal structures of power relationships within the workplace and the family, and how both of these kind of ways of looking at the welfare state then structure different aspects of family and gender policy in post-war Sweden. So we see some that were very focused on, again, in, you know, the family is a kind of in, necessary site of social reproduction for the state and capitalism. And then another that was much more focused on how do we design welfare institutions to challenge relations of domination within the family and gender relations throughout society as a whole. But this is also a kind of ironic chapter in a way um, because part of what then happens in Sweden um, uh, is due to the slowdown of economic growth in the late 60s and early 70s, you get a huge growth in, so as women are entering the workforce, you see an enormous growth in public sector employment and you see a kind of remapping of gender domination onto a divide between public and private sector employment, which contributes to the breakdown, in my view, um, of uh, nationwide collective bargaining and wage setting agreements in the 1970s, late 70s and 80s. These are really the, the groups that really start to break off from collective bargaining are heavily male dominated high skilled engineering groups. They're the kind of first to reject collective bargaining and you see a much then a much greater divide between the public and the private sector. And so this is kind of, to end my story about the kind of tentative nature of emancipation through the welfare state. So what you often see is a kind of explicit thematization of these structures of domination and effort to address them, but then also a displacement of relations of domination because, you know, the wealth, I think these welfare institutions are only, and these social movements are only ever partially able to address these sorts of structures of domination. And so um, part of the task I think we have as theorists is to be, um, you know, very sensitive to the, the emancipatory potential that we can see in the history of these sorts of social movements while still being um, critical, and this is where I guess I'm still a critical theorist, of the only ever partial uh, victories or achievements that we see in that, in that history, and to use that as a reminder for struggles today that there, there are inherent uh, dilemmas and pitfalls that democratic social movements will encounter when they try to challenge structures of domination through the welfare state. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I am very happy to explain aspects of this further. I tried to really cover the broad sweep of the whole book.
rather than segmenting off specific areas. So I recognize that some of these discussions may have been slightly um, abbreviated. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to explain things more, but also just to hear your thoughts and questions um, and have a, a conversation about the project. So thank you very much.